In our final lesson on Chapter 11, Carbohydrates, we'll consider proteoglycans. In a previous lesson, we considered glycoproteins, that is, proteins that had a small glyco or carbohydrate portion. Proteoglycans are a specialized case of glycoprotein in that they are mostly carbohydrate with only a small proportion of protein or peptide. So they're mostly glycans with a small proteo or protein portion. They often carry attachment sites for large O-linked glycosaminoglycans. In other words, the carbohydrate portion, the glycan portion, is a glycosamine and they're often attached to the protein portion at serine or threonine residues. They're most often a repeating disaccharide of an amino sugar linked with a uronic acid. We have an example at the top of our slide in chondroitin sulfate. On the right, we can see the N-acetyl group highlighted in blue that makes that an amino sugar. On the left, we can see the carboxyl group highlighted in red at the number 6 carbon, and that makes that a uronic acid. We know this is a repeating disaccharide because of the brackets and the subscript N. Our fundamental unit is a disaccharide, and it's repeated N times. Oftentimes, a sulfate group might be added after the carbohydrate has been synthesized. That's highlighted in red on our right carbohydrate and that's been added to the number 4 carbon. The protein portion may be transmembrane, it may pass all the way through the membrane, or it could be lipid linked. These sugar chains are usually on the extracellular side. Part of that has to do with the bulk of the group, but also because it's very hydrophilic, many OH groups, and so it's highly hydrated. These proteoglycans are important in our connective tissue. It acts like a sponge. Just as we can squeeze a sponge and wring out the water, we can do the same with these proteoglycans. They respond to mechanical pressure by releasing the water and shrinking in size. But they can quickly spring back to their original shape when the pressure is relieved by absorbing water. So it works as a kind of shock absorber, very important in connective tissue. Another example of a proteoglycan is a bacterial cell wall, which is made up of peptidoglycan. Again, a glycan with a small peptide portion. And that's illustrated at the bottom of our slide. It is a repeating disaccharide of N-acetylglucosamine on the left. You can see here's our N-acetyl group and on the right, N-acetylmuramic acid, and we use the acronyms NAG and NAM. So again, a repeating disaccharide to make up that cell wall. The structure of the cell wall helps to determine the overall shape of the cell, as well as providing structural support, and that prevents the rupture of the cell due to osmotic pressure. It works as a kind of molecular girdle. Here we have a representation or a model of that bacterial cell wall. On the upper left, we have a top-down view. The protein portion is in green, the carbohydrate portion, portion in orange. Keep in mind, each of those orange spheres represents an oligosaccharide of eight sugars. So the molecule is still mostly sugar with some protein connecting those sugars together. From the top-down view, you can see how porous that cell wall structure is. And that's one of the benefits of having that cell wall structure. It is porous so that we can easily move molecules into and out of the cell. We can also see on that top-down view how the individual chains are connected together, but we can see how the layers are connected a little better by that side view on the bottom right. The peptide portion connects one chain to another to create several layers of this peptidoglycan. That concludes our studies of Chapter 11. In our next video lesson, we'll begin our considerations of Chapter 12, which is a general overview of metabolism. We'll look at the two general branches of metabolism, as well as examine how nutrients are processed for use or storage.